I would love to. Avi Gilbert is the founder of Elliott Way Trader.net. His method, which he calls Fibonacci Pinball, has been called by some as the single most useful addition to the Elliott Wave lexicon and one of the most profound discoveries in Elliott Wave analysis. Today, Avi's going to go over the how the Fibonacci pinball predicts market moves, why sentiment is really what moves the markets, how Fibonacci pinball measures the market sentiment, and what's ahead for gold in the S&P 500 using this method. So Avi, are you mic'd up here? Yeah. Well, um, how do I get my, uh, my uh, screen your to screen start? Here? Depending upon your computer, if you just hover your mouse either at the bottom or the top, you should ah. see that come up. Okay. Okay, I think. All right. And then the only other challenge is making certain. Ah, it ah, looks great, yeah. Avi. Is that good? Absolutely. We see that first slide. We hear you great. You've got an hour. Take it away. Excellent. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Avi Gilbert, and I'm going to show you a bit about how our Fibonacci pinball method of Elliott Wave Analysis has allowed us to capture some of the uh, major turns in many markets over the nine years since we opened our doors at ElliottWaveTrader.net. Um, but the, uh, the, the one major issue upon which you really should focus is that I, I have found no other methodology that can put the overall market into context. And that applies to any market you're trading or, or, or trying to invest in. Uh, that alone makes this method truly invaluable. As uh, so many have told me that they, you know, they know when to buy, but have no idea when to sell. But understanding a larger degree uh, of the market context will definitely help you in that ma decision making process. But before we begin, I'm going to ask if you can please not type in any questions until the end. And I'll endeavor to get as many of those questions uh, answered that I can at the end of the presentation. So thank you. So let's move on. Let's see if I, there we go. So markets re can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. Now, while there's some historical question regarding who the author of the saying truly was, it's generally attributed to John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and during his tenure as uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan testified many times before various committees of Congress and in front of the Joint Economic Committee, Greenspan noted that markets are driven by human psychology and waves of optimism and pessimism. Now, Bernard Baruch, an exceptionally successful American financier and stock market speculator who lived from 1870 to 1965, identified the following long ago. All economic movements by their very nature are motivated by crowd psychology. Without due recognition of crowd thinking, our theories of economics leave much to be desired. It has always seemed to me that the periodic madness which afflicts mankind must reflect some deeply rooted trait in human nature, a trait akin to the force that motivates the migration of birds or the rush of lemmings to the sea. It is a force wholly impalpable Yet knowledge of it is necessary to write judgments on passing events. Now, Greenspan and Keynes are among the most well-known economists in American history, and Baruch, as noted, was an exceptionally successful businessman. All three have come to realize that markets are driven by emotion and human psychology rather than fundamentals as most believe it to be. In fact, how often have you heard pundits say that the market is simply not trading based upon fundamentals at this time? And if you've been involved in the markets for 2020, there's no doubt you've shaken your head at the market and have muttered this to yourself at one point or another through the year. But as these gentlemen have noted, one need to, needs to understand human psychology in order to be able to more accurately navigate our financial markets. So back in the 1930s, an accountant named Ralph Nelson Elliott identified behavioral patterns within the stock market, which represented the larger collective behavior patterns of society and mass. And in 1940, Elliott publicly tied the movements of human behavior to the natural law represented through Fibonacci mathematics. Thus, the, the full theoretical basis for what we now apply 
as the Elliott Wave principle has been fully developed and publicized by 1940. Now, Elliott theorized that the public, the public sentiment in mass psychology move in five waves within a primary trend and three waves within a counter trend. Once a five wave move in public sentiment is completed, then it's time for the subconscious sentiment of the public to shift in the opposite direction, which is simply the natural cycle within the human psyche and not the operative effect of some form of news. This mass form of progression and regression seems to be hardwired deep within the psyche of all living creatures. And that's what we've come to know today as the herding principle, and it gives this theory its ultimate power. Let's move on. Okay. In 1941, Elliott stated regarding financial markets that these Fibonacci ratios and series have been controlling and limiting the extent and duration of price trends, irrespective of wars, politics, production indices, the supply of money, general purchasing power, and other generally accepted methods of determining stock values. Now, in recent times, we've even seen evidence that FI even governs man's decision-making. Social experiments have been conducted over the last 30 years, which have resulted in price patterns based upon a mathematical standard that mirror those found in the stock market. This basically means that mass decision-making will move forward and move backward based upon mathematical relationships within their movements. This is the same mathematical basis with which nature is governed. The same laws that were set in place for nature also govern man's decision-making in mass and on an individual basis. And as I said, over the last 30 years, many social experiments have been conducted throughout the world which have provided scientific support to Eliot's theories presented almost a century ago. Now we know that movements in markets occur within waves and which was discovered by R. Elliot. And we also know that decision-making and changes in trend are governed by Fibonacci mathematics and the properties of phi, which has been supported by 30 years now worth of studies. So how do we apply this to our own trading to generate profits? Well, this is where our contribution to the Elliot wave world comes in. This is something that I observed within the Elliott Wave structure and have adapted it to a trading methodology and I lovingly call it Fibonacci pinball. Now, now since third waves in the Elliott Wave structure tend to be the strongest and most powerful of all the waves, it really is the ideal wave to trade. Now, since third waves themselves have to be composed of five subwaves, it helps us determine how we trade this stuff structure in a relatively low risk manner. Let me explain. After the market or stock finds a bottom after a correction, it begins a new uptrend. Such uptrend takes the form of a five wave Elliott wave structure. However, what I wanna point out is that each of the impulsive waves, waves one, three, and five, all are comprised of five waves each and waves two and four are comprised of three waves each. So effectively, each impulsive wave can be further broken down to a five wave structure ad infinitum. I mean, this is what we really mean when we say the market is fractal in nature. It means that the patterns are self-similar at different degrees of scale. Now, since wave three subdivides into five waves, and once we have waves one and two in place, it makes trading the rest of waves three, four, and five relatively easy to prognosticate in a standard impulsive wave. This is what I refer to as Fibonacci pinball. So allow me to explain a little more in depth. Once waves one and two are set up, we then set up our Fibonacci extensions based upon those two waves. Since wave three subdivides into five waves, we can use the Fibonacci extensions to provide guidance as to how wave three will now develop. Within wave, within, I'm sorry, wave one, within Roman numeral wave three, I'm not sure if you could see my pointer, that's this, wave one within Roman numeral wave three, will often target the point 3A2 or point 0.618 extension of waves Roman numeral one and two. 
here we have it targeting the 618 extension. We will then see a pullback for wave two, which often targets uh, you know, the 500 or 618 retracement of this wave one. Now, from this point, the market will usually target in a very strong rally, either the 1.0 extension for wave three of Roman numeral wave three, or as high as the 1.236 extension. Here, we have it targeting the 1.236 extension. So, uh, in the case that, like in our case here, if the market, um, if the market were to then br break down below the 764 extension, we expect it to go from the third wave, 1236 extension, to pull back to the 764 extension. If we only hit the 1.0 extension on this wave, we expect it to pull back to the 618 extension or thereabouts. Now, in our case scenario, if the market were to hit the 1236 extension and then break below the 764 extension, based upon our research, about 70% of the time, this is an early indication that this pattern will ultimately fail and then the market will be coming down hard and moving below the origination point of this rally here. So that is a very important signal point. Now, mind you, you would probably, if you're, if you're trying to get in on the one, two, one, two, you're probably buying in here. And now you have this move up and you can then move up your stops. Now, as I'm going through this, let me, uh, I mean, this is, just to explain, this is a, a very, this is a very standard framework within which we track an impulsive wave structure through waves three, four, and five. I mean, there can be further extensions beyond this, but normally you see this wave three of three targeting the one, two, three, six, up from the 1.0 to the one, two, three, six, and then pulling back to the six, one, eight, seven, six, four. One that, once that holds, your expectation is now to go up to the 1.618 extension to complete all of this Roman numeral wave three. Now, like I said, we can get extensions beyond the 1618 uh, uh, for, for that wave three. But, you know, I'm giving you the general targets we see most often. And clearly, you know, once we complete wave three, I look for a wave four pullback right back down to the 1.0 extension. And then the wave five will most often target the 2.0 extension. Okay. Now, but the purpose of this exercise really is to give you a framework through which you can track moves of any stock market I and mean, individual stocks, large markets, small markets, and it applies a great majority of the time. And as I said, wave three can and sometimes does extend beyond the 1618 extension, and that would affect the depth of the wave four pullback. So, but what makes this method so valuable is that it provides natural stops for us on the way up to lock in gains um, as each phase completes its upward trajectory. For example, once Roman numeral wave one and two complete, assuming this one, two is now completed. And let's say you're, you're looking to buy in here. Okay, great. You're looking to buy in somewhere around the 500 to 618 retrace. And let's say the market holds that and you start rallying. Well, you now have an automated point where you're going to put your stop. Your stop is going right at the bottom of this wave two. You're allowing the market to now rally up to the 618 extension generally, and then give you another one, two structure before it starts heading up strongly. Now, at this point in time, you still keep your support and your stop at wave two. Once the market then sets this up and then starts moving up, clearly you're now going to move your stop to here. And once the market hits your 1236 to 1.0 extension, well, your stop is now going to go just below the 618 extension. You're locking in profits as you go higher. That really is the purpose, you know, of this of this entire exercise to identify targets and where you lock in profits, where you put your stops. Now, most often, um, I really tell people, 
start taking your profits once we complete that third wave. And the reason I say that you take your profits is because the fourth wave is notorious for burning time in a relatively long consolidation as compared to waves one through three. So that kind of erodes a lot of the time value you have in options if you're, if you're trading in options for this, for this trade. Um, so, you know, and since your target is going to be, you know, the 1.0 extension on that wave four pullback, you can always re-enter when you get closer to the target and you won't lose any of the significant time factor, you know, especially within the options pricing. That, and that's why I tell a lot of people, especially if you're trading with anything that has time value of money attached to it, take your profits at the top of the third wave. So now we've gone through our general methodology. But let's take a look at some of the uh, major calls we've had over the year and show you how this has worked for us in practice. And, uh, and at, right after that, I'll take some questions and I've left plenty of time for questions. I know this is not an easy methodology, so I've definitely saved some time for questions at the end of it. Now, while it's not a market call I discuss very often, it's not sexy. Um, you know, many of our members think this may have been one of the most remarkable market calls we've made through, through the years. Um, back in 2011, when the dollar index was in the 73 region, next, I think that's the next one, yeah. When the, when the dollar index was down here, we called for a multi-year rally with a target over 103. Generally the 103 to 103, uh, 103.30 to 103.50 region. That was our general target. Now for those that do not trade much in the Forex world, you know, calling for a 40% rally in a currency is, is really a significant expectation. Um, and especially when you consider that the Fed was heavily involved in its QE programs at the time, and it caused everyone and their grandmother to be certain that the dollar was about to collapse. But at the same time, we were calling for a 40% rally in that environment, and many were looking at me like I was simply crazy. Well, as we know today, not only did the dollar rally in the face of this unprecedented QE, which was supposedly to have it caused to crash, um, it reached a high of 103.82. And that was within 30 to 50 cents of our long-term target that we set back in, uh, back in 2011. So, I mean, that, that was, that's one example of the, uh, the types of calls we've had. Um, another example uh, is, uh, for example, let's look at gold. I don't know how many of you have followed my gold work through the years, but back in the summer of 2011, uh, gold would rally as much as $50 in a single day. And it, it, everyone in the market, if you remember that, for those of you that were trading at the time, um, everyone was certain that we were going to exceed the 2000 mark that year. In fact, I mean, the way the pundits, analysts, investors, anyway, everyone was talking that summer, not only was $2,000 a foregone conclusion, the real arguments were really being had about how much beyond 2000 are we certainly going to go. But back in uh, August of uh, 2011, I wrote the following over there. Since we are most probably in the final stages of this parabolic fifth wave blow off top, I would seriously consider anything approaching 1915 level to be a potential target for a top at this time. Now, as we now know, gold topped within $6 of our target. And even before gold topped, I outlined my expectations where pullback can take us. I noted that if we broke a certain level of support, which is about the 0.3A2 retracement, um, then I can easily see gold dropping back down to the 700 to 1000 region from the 1900 region. And remember, I wrote this while gold was still in the midst of its parabolic run where everybody was certain it was going over 2000. And I started talking about 1000 as a target. Now, I'm sure you can understand how everyone that read this analysis viewed it. Let's just say that, you know, the kind commenters told me that I was absolutely crazy. Now, as we now know, gold dropped down to the 1050 region before it bottomed. Now, that, I mean, however, what was really incredible about that was during that entire decline, all the fundamentalists who were uber bullish gold at the highs in 2011, 
remain bullish all the way down. It was remarkable, absolutely remarkable. I, I was stunned watching it. But what was even more incredible was that as we were approaching the 1000 region, they began to turn bearish. It was astounding to watch it happen in real time. And almost in unison, the belief became that gold would certainly drop below 1000 before we can even consider a bottom being struck. But again, we began looking the other way when the boat became a little too heavily weighted. Um, in fact, the night that gold actually struck bottom, I was on the phone with Doug Eber Eberhardt of buygoldandsilversafely.com, putting my final order in for my purchases that night and informed my members I was doing so within our trading room. And yes, that, that night was the actual bottom struck in gold. And we've been in this multi-year rally ever since and still have further to go. Now, let me take you uh, through a few, uh, by the way, this is something uh, that I wrote to, um, to our members and I then even posted it publicly that, uh, you know, at the end of December, I said, now is the time to start moving back in to the market, even though everybody still thinks you know, we're going much lower. So let's move on. Uh, like I said, I want to leave plenty of time for questions because usually the questions are, are, are the most interesting part of the, uh, the presentation that I've seen. Get some really great questions coming out from you guys quite often. So back in 2015, I outlined to our members that I had expected the S&P to top out in the 2100 region, drop down to the 1800 region, and then begin a global melt up. I expected a quote unquote global melt up um, within the next few years thereafter, starting in early 2016. Well, this was during a period of time when the Fed was reducing its balance sheet. And there was, again, unanimous certainty that this was, you know, my expectation was a complete impossibility when the Fed was no longer standing behind the market. I mean, everybody thought with the Fed reducing its balance sheet, market is bound to crash. Well, I think we know that that's not the case. And, um, and my, uh, my staff actually outlined our calls throughout 2016 as we caught almost every twist and turn that year. Um, and, and as we went into the 2016 election, I reiterated my perspective that the market was setting up to rally strongly over the 2600 region. Mind you, we were in the 2100 region at the time, and I was looking for a rally to at least 2600 with potential to extend 3000. And I said this, and I kept quoting this, no matter who won the election. And if you remember that time period, the common expectation was that if Trump was elected, the market was going to crash but I continue to pound the table that we were likely headed over 2,600, no matter who was elected. Now, for one less example, let's take a look at the bond market. Let's see here, there we go. Now, for many years, many were calling for an end to the bond market almost weekly. As we know, they have been continually wrong. But on June 27th, 2016, and we noted there with the arrow uh, in red, um, I wrote an update for our members that was entitled, Beware of Bonds Blowing Up. And within that article, I was calling for a local top in the bond market, not necessarily the end of the bond market, but a local top in the bond market with the expectation of a large correction. And when I was calling for this top, I was getting quite a bit of pushback from our members because the Fed was still lowering rates. So I was told that I simply cannot fight the Fed. But as we now know, and you can see it in the chart, within two weeks of that article, the TLT struck a local top and proceeded to drop 22%. Then in November of 2018, I was again telling those who followed my analysis that bonds were looking like they were finally bottoming as we approached my major support region noted on this chart. In fact, I noted in our chat room that I was buying TLT when we struck 113, and my first target was in the 124 region where I thought we would see a pullback and then head much, much higher. 
Yeah, if you remember that time period also, the Fed was strongly signaling that it was continuing down the path of raising rates at the time. And again, I was getting pushed back because it simply cannot fight the Fed. Well, we know how it turned out. Market did exactly what we expected. It began, it, it bottomed right at our support and it began a strong rally to our first target and then as we know where bonds are sitting right now we have gone significantly higher now while there really is no method that is perfect uh, i you know i i've not found any method that can provide you with market context in the way that our fibonacci pinball system of Elliott wave analysis does so i'm sure many of you were wondering how did we do during 2020 well to be honest i'm actually embarrassed to say that we have been doing extraordinarily well and it has been one of our best years to date as we came into 2020 i'll admit that the s p blew through my upside expectation um, which was initially a 3100 spx uh, the s p 500 and it continued to rally as we know to 3400 so i missed 300 points i caught the bottom at 2350 the prior year and I expected us to rally to 3,000 to 3,100-ish. Once we moved 3,100, it became too rich for my blood. So I, I did not catch that 300 points. And the reason I did not catch it is because I maintained a very cautious stance during that time, since many other charts were saying that the SPX was giving us a very dangerous blow-off top. And in fact, in February, I outlined a short trade for our members in the EEM, and it's presented here. As you can see, I was looking for a short position in the 44 to 45 region with an ideal target below at the 1.0 extension in the 31 region. And yes, this was in the face of a strongly rallying SPX chart in which I didn't want to participate on the long side once we got over the 3100 region. And the reason I chose this chart to short was because it provided us with the lowest risk opportunity that provided a much, a much better outline for, uh, for risk from a risk management standpoint because it gave us wonderful trade parameters for this trade. Now, as we know, the EEM not only hit our target of 31, it even spiked a bit below it before we turned back up strongly. In fact, we have an ideal bottom target in the SPX at 31.87, and the SPX bottomed out within four points of that target at, at 31.91. So, but if you remember what the feeling was at that time, I mean, it was pure pandemonium in the market. And, and I mean, the fear was absolutely palpable. So when the market broke down below 2,300 in the S&P, I told the members in our trading room that I was buying back into the market. And I'm sure you can understand how, how our members thought I may have a screw loose. I'll tell you, in fact, when, when, when I asked my wife to go buy back into the market with our children's 520, you know, 529 college funds, because we were 100% cash during that decline, she even gave me a straight look and asked me, are you sure? So again, you know, there, there really is no method that is perfect out there, but this method provides you with market context in a way that I've never seen from any other methodology. It gives us very strong warnings as to when a rally is nearing completion, as well as when a decline is nearing completion. I mean, as you can see from the you know, examples above. And the most important thing is that it allows you to tune out all the noise and emotion that is prevalent throughout the rest of the market and only focus on what matters. So as one of our members once aptly said, uh, the goal of EW analysis is to analyze sentiment and not to participate in it. So that is the conclusion of my, um, of my presentation and let me see if I can figure out how, oh, screen sharing stopped. How do I find the questions and answers, I think? I, okay, 
If you guys would like to put in your questions and answers, um, I will answer them as well as I possibly can. So what happens when the main impulse wave completes wave five? Well, you know, once you're completing a five wave structure, you know, it's telling you that the trend is coming to an end. So, you know, it depends on how aggressive, um, how aggressive you are. You know, one, you could either start entering short trades, but personally, I'd much rather, uh, I, I'd much rather like to get aggressive on downside structures, um, on, uh, on corrective balances rather than right off the bat. Um, so when, when you complete a five wave structure, guys, it's telling you that the, the trend is coming to a conclusion, uh, similar to what we, um, what we said with, uh, what we said with the, uh, the gold structure or the, on structure. I mean, it tells us it prepare for a trend change. That's really what it tells you. Okay. How do you identify the start of a wave one? That is an excellent question. Hey, Avi, it's, it's Raleigh. I would just want to chime in for a minute. Your screen went blank. So oh. I just grabbed your introductory screen. If you would like to grab the screen back for your illustrations, please do so. No, I think that's fine. That works for me. It's fine. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just gladly just answer the question. How do you identify the start of a wave one? That is an excellent question. And it really has to do with, uh, with analyzing the prior corrective structure. For example, um, oftentimes, like I said, when, when, you, when, you have, when you have your corrective structure, it's going to be a three wave structure. And that's how you identify the bottoming you're looking to uh, analyze a three wave structure that's completing a correction. N most often, the first wave down and the third wave down within that three wave corrective structure, and we label it A, B, C. A is the first wave down, B is the corrective rally, C is the third wave down, that's a corrective structure, A, B, C. Most often, A and C have very uh, uh, distinct relationships. The most common relationship is an A equals C. The size of the A wave is often, uh, is often the same size as the C wave. And um, within this, the C wave itself, a C wave is a five wave structure itself. And that's common to C waves, not A waves. Within the five wave structure of the C wave, you're also trying to identify where that five wave structure will conclude. And if you have confluence with the ratios between the, a, the larger A and C structures, as well as how that five wave structure in the C wave is completing, and you have a nice point of confluence, that is the point at which you expect the market to turn back up or down, however, whichever way you're looking at the correction. And that will likely be the start of your wave one in the opposite direction. So it's a little complex, but that's probably the best answer I can give you. My view of silver at this time, I mean, pretty simply, we're still, we're still working on a corrective structure. My next upside target is probably 36, could be a bit higher. Uh, a lot depends on how the, uh, the setup for the next structure develops. Uh, any thoughts on an upper target for S&P? Yes. Um, my expectation is probably somewhere minimally about 5,000 on the S&P. Uh, I would prefer 6,000. It works better on the longer time frames. I'm guesstimating somewhere around 2023. Does the wave structure use time as well? That, Mark, that is an excellent question. I get that question all the time. And I'm going to tell you, I, I am an accountant and a lawyer by training. I have done a significant amount of research into markets, market history, market methodologies. I have put in a significant amount of time into attempting to identify a timing aspect within the market. You know, you see a lot of these cycles analysts. I will tell you, I have, I have, I have studied in great deal their analysis methodologies. And I have asked each and every one of those experts, explain to me how you can place a linear box around a market and timing 
that is purely nonlinear in nature. And when somebody can actually explain an answer to me for that question, then I'd be more than willing to listen to their methodology. Because up until that point, when I have picked apart the methodologies that they all use, I have not found a single one that is accurate more than 50% of the time. You could toss a coin effectively to get the same results. So when it comes to timing, I have yet seen anything that can get timing better than 50% of the time. So no, timing is not something that I would ever say you can look to or expect. I just don't think that is answerable within, any, within a methodology perspective, at least based upon my years of analysis. What's your current wave count for the S&P 500? Well, I'm expecting that we are completing out uh, a five wave structure off the March lows. And I am looking for a corrective pullback before we begin what I would like to see as a major rally phase as we look towards 2021. That is my general expectation. Uh, gold is not approaching a wave five yet. I don't believe we've completed wave three yet. So we, I still think we have more to go in, in the metals. I don't think we are, uh, we are done just yet. Gold bugs are telling, are telling gold to explode, so to say. So the sentiment is getting too positive. Times to be, you know, I, I will tell you, I would ignore what gold bugs say 100% of the time. Absolutely ignore them because they will say that no matter what is happening. Gold's going to explode. Gold's going to explode. Overnight, it'll be 5,000. Sorry, folks. You know, anybody that is a perma anything should be summarily dismissed. Ignore them. They are useless to you. Um, and that includes gold bugs. I'm sorry to say. I am a big fan of gold and gold mining stocks. But at the same time, I'm, I'm not oblivious to recognizing markets don't move in just one direction. So, you know, back in 2011, I was preparing for a big correction in gold. And as we were moving into 2015, um, I think uh, I was starting to buy in August of 2015, I started loading up on some mining stocks. Um, one of them being Barrick. I bought Barrick at seven, you know, around the seven region. I mean, it's multiplied by four since then. So, I, you know, I started buying back again in August. So, you know, during that entire decline, ignored the gold bugs, which I suggested everybody should. And, you know, as we continue higher, great. You know, if the gold bugs are joining us, wonderful. I, you know, they're, 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 they're I really think just ignore anything they say. I don't think they will help you one way or the other. Um, the structure tells us most of what we need to know. We're still in a corrective structure. I think we should be ending this soon. And then I think we're going to see uh, another strong rally um, that'll take us a number of months before we complete. The market today is going down. Is the top now set? Super cycle five. I, I just I just said, I don't expect this to be completed. I still think we have much higher to go. Um, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not set in stone if the market tells me, if I see something in the market that tells me otherwise, okay, otherwise, I think that five to 6,000 region is going to be a really nice target out around 2023 or so. After a counter trend, how do you then decide if it's going an upside or downside primary trend? Again, Mike, that really depends on the context of the larger degree pattern. So you really have to look at what time frame you're talking about. You know, if you're looking at a five minute chart, I would suggest you understand what the 60 minute chart is presenting in the bigger time frame. If you're looking at a 60 minute chart, you look, look at the daily. If you're looking at your daily, look at a weekly or monthly. If you're looking at weekly or monthly, look at a, a yearly chart. So you're always looking at everything within context. And we have wave counts for all those degrees. And it tells us where we believe we are in the larger context and taking it all the way down through the various time frames. I mean, I put out charts as small as three and five minutes. I won't go below a three minute really. What about dollar futures? Dollar, uh, 
I think we are bottoming out in the dollar shortly. And I think you're going to see a uh, probably a multi-week corrective rally in the dollar before you're going to see much lower again. Um, but I think in 2021, we'll probably hit a, uh, a nice bottoming in the dollar. And then I think you're, you may see a multi-month rally in the dollar, but I think it will likely be corrective in nature. Uh, would my prognostication for S&P 500, regardless of who wins the 2020 presidential campaign? Well, the 20 election. Well, since my 2016 prognostication for the S&P 500 was regardless of who wins the election, I think I'm going to let my 2020 prognostication remain the same. <laughs> I, you know, like I said, you know, uh, people, I, I you know, pe people take me to task because, you know, I really don't care what the substance of the news is. I have seen gold, for example, I actually have written articles about this. On a Thursday, I see inflation numbers come out, gold rallies. I see the same inflation numbers that are reiterated by another report on Friday, gold declines. For Thursday, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the people are saying that gold rallied because of these, you know, because of these um, inflation expectations. And then on Friday, gold declined because of the inflation expectations. The exact same expectations. So, you know, trying to really listen to all the talking heads and trying to, to, to parse what news matters, what news doesn't, at the end of the day, for me, it's truly immaterial. For me, it really is about math and structure. Uh, do members use your Roman numeral waves or the subways do most of the trading positions, or is this an individual preference? For example, you could buy the beginning. It really is an individual preference. When you, when you come on to my site, and I'll tell you, right now, we have, we, we're about to celebrate our ninth anniversary. We have over 6,000 members that have joined us in, 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 the, in those nine years. Almost 1,000 of them are money manager clients. Um, and we have uh, 18 analysts, including myself. So whenever we get a new member coming on, and all 6,000 are seeing that same letter from me, you get an opening letter from me. And it gives you very general um, uh, coaching as to what you need to be doing if you have not done it to date. One of the things that I say to you is you need to understand the type of trader slash investor that you are. Are you a trader? What time frame do you like to trade? Are you an investor? Am I missing something? Oh. <laughs> Okay, so are you an investor? Are you a trader? What time frame do you like? So a lot of it really is based upon knowing yourself. You cannot be successful unless you know yourself. That really is what it comes down to. So you have to figure out what is the best phase of a rally for you to trade. For most people, for most people, um, I think the third wave is, is by far the best to trade. Unless, you're a, unless you trade commodities, the fifth wave in commodities are most often the strongest. So it really depends. You really need to know yourself. Missed the out. After a counter trend, how do you decide that's going to... I, 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 I already answered that. Um, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, CW. One of the people who LA Wave Trader is a must-have service. I've been a member for the past seven years. Incredible service. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> you, you started with us for quite some time ago, and we, we, and we started, we're, we're about to celebrate our ninth anniversary. Um, okay, I think I've gotten to all the questions. Uh, I think I've gotten to all the questions. Well, there's, I, I've got some more that I've written down here, Avi. If you've got, uh, if you'd like, we've got, a, we've got a few more minutes. We've got about 10 more what? minutes. So let me go ahead and feed these to you. Uh, so uh, Rodolfo says, what's the best time frame for the first use Elliott waves? You know, the, if you're taking a chart and you're just looking at the chart, and you're starting with a fresh chart, Minimally, I, su I suggest you look at an, you know, a, a yearly chart, minimally. Um, normally, I can look at a chart and it'll take me about two to three seconds 
to make a determination if I'm interested in the chart or not. And I can base it upon the structure I see on the, on, you know, the year long chart. If I see a very clear structure, I want to now go into that a little more. And that's just, just by eyeing it, you can tell that. So I'll eye a chart, an annual chart. And if I like it, well, I'll take that chart apart from an annual basis and I'll start applying my wave count on the annual basis. And then I'm going to drop it down to a daily chart. And then I go, and you know, you could start with a monthly chart even. I mean, there's nothing that says you can't even do a monthly chart. It really depends on what you want to trade. And you know, you could take it down to the monthly, you take it down to the daily, you could take it down to the 60 minute. But the thing about it is because the markets are fractal, your wave count has to make sense and has to, has to be a solid wave count that applies to the Fibonacci pinball structures on all those time frames. If you're able to set that up on all those time frames, you now have a very, very solid wave count that will be extraordinarily valuable to you in being able to trade going forward. That's a good so, point. It, it, you know, I, I suggest you start wide and work your way down. If everything lines up on your way down, that chart will be worth gold in your hands. All right. So we have another question that's come in. Um, this, and this is more just a comment on activity this year. So have you seen an abnormal interruption of waves? In other words, a shorter third wave and a longer fourth wave as a result of what we've seen so far this year? The answer is the only thing I have really seen, and I think it's something I can attribute to over the last 10 years maybe, um, and I think it just gets more and more pronounced uh, as, we, as, we, as computers get faster and faster. I think we see faster speeds in the market we don't necessarily see the, the patterns changing. We just see them moving at faster speeds. So that's probably the best way I can answer that. The markets are moving a lot faster today, but the structures really have remained relatively well encapsulated within you know, the standard structure we expect. Okay. And a couple other questions here before we wrap things up. This is an interesting one. Any thoughts on a methodology for vertical Fibonacci, let's say from like January to September? Again, you know, a timing standpoint, I, you know, yeah. I, I have tried, I've tried in so many ways to adopt and figure out timing. If you're looking at that, I, I have yet to find anything that is better than 50%. Okay. And the last question uh, Avi here is how do we count and label all the cycles and sub cycles? <laughs> well, first of all, you have to understand how to do Elliott wave analysis. And then I say, you know, whatever chart you're looking at, you could start with, you know, an annual, you could start with a monthly, you could start with a weekly, wherever you want to start, you got to get started and you apply your wave count to the larger degree. And then once your wave count looks solid at the larger degree, focus in on the smaller degrees to fill in what's in between the larger degree. And if sure. things continually make sense as you're moving down in the fractals, well, now, like I said, now you have a, you have, I can't say this, you have something that is worth its weight in gold, much more than its weight, because it's a piece of paper if you print it out, but it's worth much more than it's worth weight, weight in gold um, if, you, uh, if you're able to, uh, to align all the different fractals on that chart, it's going to give you a very high probability expectation going forward. Okay. Excellent. Well, Avi, before we go, I'm just going to pop up another slide here because I believe there's an offer uh, that your team has put together for the Elliott Wave Trader flagship service. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I, I, like I said, our service covers, um, covers world indices, covers all different types of commodities, covers uh, all different currencies. We, we, have, we have 18 analysts that are literally covering the world. And we have a, uh, a chat room in which we interact with all of our members. 
Um, and you get immediate feedback from all of us. Um, we encourage people to try and, you know, to learn our methodology. We ask them to post in the room. We'll critique your analysis. This is really how you learn. Our goal, when we first started Elliott Wave Trader almost nine years ago, our goal was not to give our members a fish. Our goal was to teach each and every person how to fish. Because then you could just take it and do it on your own. But that really is our goal. So, you know, and that's what we do in our main service. We have a whole host of other services. You know, some are trading services, uh, you know, where they'll give you the entry and exit. But our main service is really to focus on teaching you first and foremost. And we really encourage you to learn before you move forward and being able to apply it. Learning is so important and it will open your eyes as to how markets really work shockingly. I mean, it'll shock you at times. I've been doing this for, for decades and I'm still shocked at some of the turning points that I see. So, you know, we have a 15 day trial at, you know, at our site, uh, more than welcome to test us out, come join us. We, like I said, we have over 6,000 members and almost a thousand money manager clients posting and they're not all posting at the same time, of course, uh, but uh, right. you'll, you'll see a lot of very uh, highly, not just highly intelligent and learned, but highly experienced members that you'll see in the room. Outstanding. Well, Avi, thank you so much for putting together this presentation and for spending time with us today. I know that you're a busy guy. You're definitely a, a font of knowledge on this. And I would encourage people to check out ElliottWaveTrader.net for all the material that they have there, because many of the questions that you were asking here about how's the best way to, to start to diagram a wave, for example, and how do you you know, handle these types of things. There's a wealth of information there. There's a tremendous service here, the 15 day free trial, the live coaching sessions and the webinars, and they cover stocks, options, futures, currency analysis, you know, the whole gamut of things because this solution can be applied against any market and any time frame. So if you go to westmarktrading.com forward slash M9 dash advice, that'll take you right there. And that'll introduce you to Avi and his team. Avi, thank you so much for your time today. Really do appreciate you being here with us. Thank you for having me.